Hi, this is the Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available online, free for viewing, at www.philosophypublishing.com. They're also available free upon a request as an attachment to an email, which is posted at the website. Along with me is today's panelist, Mark Brennan, professor at the school, at the Stern School of Business, New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, established 1809. Mark, good to have you. Hi, Chris. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. The format of the philosophical angle is that your host will bring forth an opening statement on the nature of the concept, and Mark and I will then discuss it. This week, Bain Capital uh, that is in the media presently today. Often we hear in Bain Capital uh, is a private equity uh, firm that has uh, uh, that buys uh, that was owned at one time by Mitt Romney, a presidential candidate. And sometimes you hear the news regarding Bain Capital making scenarios as follows. Bain, as an investor, will come in and buy a company, and then borrows money off the company balance sheet, loads it up with debt, takes out cash, puts it in his pocket, sells the company, makes a killing. Well, somehow the philosophical angle has decided that this might not be the total truth in, with regard to private investors, and particularly uh, Bain Capital and others that do the, that uh, make investments in companies. Also, we're going to uh, start with a, a piece from the, uh, an op-ed piece from the New York Times called Egos and Immortality by Paul Krugman on May 24th, in which he says, and I'll read from his article, once upon a time this fairy tale tells us America was a land of lazy managers and slacker workers. Productivity languished and American industry was fading away in the face of foreign <coughs> competition. Then square-jawed, tough-minded, buyout kings like Mitt Romney and the fictional Gordon Gecko came to the rescue, imposing financial and work discipline. Sure, some people didn't like it, and sure, <coughs> they made a lot of money for themselves along the way. But the result was a great economic revival whose benefits trickled down to everyone. You can see why Wall Street likes this story. But none of it, except the bit about the geckos and the Romneys, making lots of money is true. For the alleged productivity surge never really happened. In fact, overall business productivity in America grew faster in the post-war generation, an era in which banks were tightly regulated and private equity barely existed than it has since our political system decided that greed was good. What about international competition? We now think of America as a nation doomed to perpetual trade deficits, but it was not always thus. From the 1950s through the 1970s, we generally had more or less trade, a balanced trade exporting about 
as much as we imported. The big trade deficits only started in the Reagan years, that is, during the era of runaway finance. Mr. Krugman goes on to say further, and, and what about that trickle down? It never took place. There have been significant productivity gains these past three decades, although not on the scale that Wall Street self-serving legend would have you believe. However, only a small part of these gains ha got passed on to the American workers. So no, financial wheeling and dealing did not do wonders for the American economy. And there are real questions about why exactly the Wheeler dealers have made so much money while generating such dubious results. Those are, however, questions that the Wheeler dealers don't want asked, and not, I think, just because they want to defend their tax breaks and other privileges. It's also an ego thing. Vast wealth isn't enough. They want deference, too. And they're doing their best to buy it. It has been amazing to read about erstwhile Democrats on Wall Street going all in for Mitt Romney, not because they believe that he has good policy ideas, but because they're talking, they're taking President Obama's very mild criticism of financial excess as a personal insult. And it has been especially sad to see some Democratic politicians with ties to Wall Street, like Newark's mayor, Cory Booker, dutifully rise to the defense of their friends' surprisingly frag uh, fragile egos. As I said at the beginning, in a way, Wall Street's self-centered, self-absorbed behavior has been kind of funny. But while this behavior may be funny, it is also deeply immoral. Think about where we are now in the fifth year of a slump brought on by irresponsible bankers. The bankers themselves have been bailed out, but the rest of the nation continues to suffer terribly. With long-term unemployment still at levels not seen since the Great Depression, with a whole cohort of young Americans graduating into an, an abysmal job market. It's obvious Mr. Krugman doesn't like deal makers or profits. So we're going to uh, we're going to parse that a little bit. And uh, with the criticisms of Mitt Romney and his deal making, why is it good? Why is deal making good? Let's act, let's examine it. In every deal, there is a sacrifice, a sacrifice of the risk, the information and, 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 and knowledge, the time and effort to make some sort of decision. For example, to buy a company. You're taking a risk in buying it. You're using your information on whether this is a good company to buy. You're using your time and your effort your past resources, all come forward to discern whether this company is right for you and whether to buy it. But what they've done previously is they usually found something that was being run poorly, not at the top of their industry. And because it's not doing well compared to the rest of the industry, it can be had at a good price. So the company is for sale at a good price. But what does the investor do? The investor studies the industry, finds out why some companies do well, why others don't. And then it formulates a plan. It uses its knowledge that it has in studying the industry, and the individual knowledge of the, uh, the investors inside uh, the, the private equity firm, constructs a plan, finds that company, comes in, buys it at a good price, and that's its reward. It has, it has found a, a company that, it, uh, that is it has decided to buy, 
and it's its reward for its endeavors in searching out a good company. So it owns the company, and then what does it do? It adds this plan up here, and it's knowledge about the investor, about, how, how, about the industry. And it adds that to the company management. And there are many companies throughout history that have been great and then suddenly have bought, fawn, gone by the wayside because of management has become stayed or have not kept up with, kept up with the, the, the changing knowledge in the industry. Good examples. Kodak, General Motors. They just didn't keep up with the, the knowledge necessary to run that industry well, to be competitive in the industry. So the private equity firm comes in, buys it, adds in its knowledge, which is a requisite portion of any transaction. And then from that knowledge, it makes an efficiency. And that is the key to making a company be more competitive in its economic niche. So it's become more uh, efficient and thus a natural outgrowth of the efficiency is the profit. So I'd like to go with uh, to you, Mark, uh, to see if you're, uh, what your initial response is to Bain Capital, private, uh, private equity investment, and the storyline uh, story that's being put out by much of the media. Well, as the media does on every topic, they've just skewed this into uh, fitting their political ends. And what you were reading with the Krugman piece, of course, it has to start with an ad hominem attack, the square-jawed Mitt Romney. I can't stand Romney, but if you're going to take on issues with the guy, stop with the ad hominem attacks. I mean, honestly, this guy is supposedly a Nobel Prize winner, and he has to revert to ad hominem attacks, and then also impugn Gordon Gecko, who, by the way, is a fictional character. This is the kind of nonsense that comes out of these people. Right. So putting that aside for a second, I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from calling Krugman a bomb-throwing leftist. I'll refrain from ad hominem attacks, because I'll rise above his, his stupidity, uh, or his childishness, because he is a very smart guy. But what he has a problem with is not actually private equity. What he has a problem with is the entire capitalist profit-making free enterprise system. And instead, he takes people like Mitt Romney and crucifies them and says, this shouldn't be done. Well, actually, you know what shouldn't be done? What shouldn't be done is companies should not be driven into the ground to the point where they are now targets of private equity firms. So when managements are lining their own pockets, and Krugman's not vociferous enough about this, or when companies are outsourcing um, jobs to the Philippines and India and everywhere else. Uh, he's, he's remiss to do that. But when it comes to a political battle where his guy is getting hit, where uh, Obama is getting hit, now he's got to defend it and defend it with ad hominem attacks. So I find the whole thing offensive and really counterproductive to us moving any way, shape, or form forward. And. Uh... And I'm, I, I'm gl I was uh, glad to see that you uh, talked about the, the knowledge of the, of the investors coming in to, uh, to make the companies uh, uh, better off. And also, I liked uh, the fact that if it were not for private equity, who else would do it? Who else would c come in and turn around a, a company and, and make management better and make them more competitive? Such as a well, you know, to answer that question, I know you're kind of saying it, asking it rhetorically. But I think his plan and Obama's plan would be, well, these things should be nationalized and they should just be government entities. Because then we could put in things like ridiculous racial and gender quotas in the workforce. We could socialize the profits. We could socialize the risk. They would become like the post office in terms of productivity and efficiency. And they would be happier that way if we were to turn our co economy into something more closely resembling that of Cubans, which is a complete nightmare and doesn't work. But until we get to that point, he won't be happy. You know, these people started off as economic Marxists, and now they've become cultural Marxists. And they're continuing their Gramscian march through the institutions, 
and Krugman's doing it right from the opinion pages of the New York Times. And when he hears things like what we're saying, he gets all up in a tizzy and he accuses us of bigotry and hatred. Uh, and really what we're proposing, we're being as kind of radical and revolutionary as he is, because capitalism is anything but conservative. Capitalism is about as revolutionary as you can be. True conservative finds capitalism abhorrent in many ways for its complete uh, uh, dismissal of things like tradition, uh, culture, loyalty, patriotism. Uh, we're actually on his side on this. It's just that he's doing the Marxist version of it, and we are doing the classical liberal version of it. Do you get the feeling that he doesn't like profits? He doesn't per say. I think he's okay with profits. He doesn't. What he doesn't like, he doesn't like where they go, and they go into risk takers' profits. And he would say, "Oh, they're not taking a risk." You know what? Buying a stock is taking a risk. Putting your money in the bank is not really taking a risk because you've got government insurance. When you buy a stock, when you put money on the line to fund a company, when you buy the bonds of a company, those are all risks. Now, buying bonds of a company have become less risky because the Obama administration has decided to bail out everybody they meet who has a problem, uh, and ditto for the Bush administration. Actually, the Obama administration is just aping what the Bush administration did. So uh, he doesn't, I don't, I don't know what he thinks about profits, but I know he hates when they go into people's pockets because then they do horrible things like they hire nannies and they buy big houses and they do all the kinds of things that he hates. Yeah, and then they take some of that and make a firm maybe called Bain Capital or some other private equity make an investment, buy another company, put more knowledge into it, make the company more efficient, make more profits from their knowledge. Yeah, oh, my Chris, Lord. You forgot, to mention, you forgot to mention, they're all square-jawed jerks and Gordon Geckos. You know, always throw in the ad hominem like he does. Well, maybe it is that Gordon Gecko wasn't such a bad guy after all. Maybe he had some good qualities. I didn't really see the movie. But if he's like well, Mitt Romney, like maybe he did. He's a fictional character. You know, Karl Marx, Antonio Gramsci, Barack Obama, these are not fictional characters. Fidel Castro is not a fictional character. These are dangerous people with dangerous historical precedents. Krugman wants us going down that path. It really scares me. You know, uh, there's a, a, a big um, to-do about jobs and the, and the rate of uh, employment uh, uh, not having improved enough uh, uh, over the last uh, few years since Obama has taken office. What would you say, aren't profits really the, uh, uh, the raw material by which jobs can be created? Would you agree well, with that it, statement? Yeah, sure. It's, it's, a big part, it's a big part of the you know, business creation process. It's not the sole part. But without profits, you're not going to have businesses. So why would you ever go into business? Why would you put all the effort in? Why would you put your capital at risk if there were no profits? Luckily, we haven't reached that state yet. We will eventually if he keeps pushing his programs and people actually listen to him. But you know, another group that he fails to take into account for skewering, who deserves more than anyone, and he keeps beating around the bush with this, is just rent seekers in general and what Tocqueville calls factions in the government. And these are people who manipulate uh, the political or social environment to get an unfair advantage in a market that profit seekers are trying to make profits in. So when people go down and lobby Washington, D.C., and when they, you know, whether it's the agricultural lobby, the gun lobby, the Cuban lobby, the Israel lobby, whatever lobby, these are all rent seekers who are looking to take uh, government power and, and either get a monopoly power or some advantage through political manipulation. And it would be nice if Krugman would take them on. He's willing to take on Bain Capital, and he's willing to take on anyone who's kind of a Republican supporter. But I say take on all the rent seekers. You know, uh, you used that term rent seekers. Uh, could, you, could you define that for us, please? Sure. A rent seeker, you know, there are two kinds of behavior you can kind of do out in the market. One is profit seeking, which is where you make a profit, uh, make a product, and then you sell it for a higher price and keep the profit. What a rent seeker does is a rent seeker has a, a product that no one wants. So what he does is he pays a lobbyist to go down to the government and arrange the market such that he might have monopoly power on something. So you might go tomorrow, Chris, and buy the typewriter ribbon patent. You know, there's somebody sitting somewhere in an apartment somewhere who has the typewriter ribbon patent, and none of us use typewriter ribbons anymore. And if you paid, I, I, I guarantee you can get this done. If you paid lobbyists enough to, to get them to go down to Washington, D.C. and outlaw laser printers and to outlaw any kind of computer printer such that we all have to go back to typewriters, 
you can make a ton of money off of selling your typewriter ribbons. And that's essentially what a rent seeker does. He makes the market inefficient by manipulating the government in such a way that he gets a monopoly uh, advantage. So think of any monopoly that's out there, and there was probably some rent seeker who went out and got that monopoly done. Think about the, the sugar, uh, sugar market in the United States. Americans pay twice the price per pound of sugar as, uh, as the international price on the market. It's something like we paid 40 cents, the international price is 20 cents. That's not because we can't bring sugar to this country physically and boats can't reach us. That's because the rent seekers went down to Washington, D.C. and paid the government to put these uh, price supports for them and tariffs and all these impediments into equalizing the American price of sugar with the world price. And that's what rent seekers do all day. And I wish Krugman would take them on. They're all over the place. You know, when banks go down to Washington and demand bailouts because they screwed up so badly and they want to socialize their costs and their expenses, that's pure rent seeking behavior. It's nauseating for anyone, especially conservatives. Krugman misses a lot of it and refuses to talk about it. When when rent seeking is done by, by say, unions. Well, I would say possibly we could substitute the term parasite then. It's really somebody. Yeah, they are parasites. That's gaining, uh, that's gaining government uh, subsidies at the expense of the taxpayer uh, for his own benefit and profit yeah, motive. Often, oftentimes the host will you know, reject the parasite or try to kill the parasite. And if the banks get too greedy with their rent-seeking behavior, that's going to be a problem when the host, I mean, you see the host starting to reject it now. You see things like uh, Occupy Wall Street. You see a lot of anti-bank sentiment. The host body is starting to realize, hey, we're getting taken advantage of here by a bunch of high-paid lobbyists. Right. And, and so, but really, and, when and the, capital. your rent seeker or, or the parasite on the government dole is really after it for greater profits, the very thing that the Obama administration and uh, Mr. Krugman are admonishing and criticizing. But rent seekers seek to make greater profits through government enforced protection in markets, as opposed to a profit seeker who's just out there selling his product and trying to make more money by being more efficient on the cost side and driving up revenues on the quality side. So a rent seeker, really, this is th that, that's a bad comparison. Oh, it's really not a comparison. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out that there's a dichotomy of the ability to go after profit. One is which would be the, uh, the normal capitalistic free market investor who takes his own risk, his own knowledge, his own time and effort into making a, a, a some kind of investment, whether it's to uh, go out and till a garden in the out back of his house, or, or whether to go to work, or whether to uh, buy a piece of stock at the stock market, or a share, or, or whatever, as opposed to someone who games the system, becomes parasitic, uses as Mark said, are, becomes a, a, the rent seeker mentality to deliver his, uh, into his pocket some profits through the uh, courtesy of the, uh, the stock of the uh, uh, taxpayers uh, of, the, uh, of the United States. We know Krugman has written a lot on manufacturing productivity and how productivity is the only way the economy can grow. Um, but he neglects or refuses to acknowledge that the productivity of capital is also important and that today capital is mobile and if capital is not getting the returns that it requires or that it demands or that it, it seeks in the United States, it will go other places. So you can bash Bain capital all you want. It probably might, it would, it would, it would be a better idea if politicians and left-wingers were to try and figure out what exactly is it the capital wants, how can we help them reach it because, you know, in a rising tide or in a, in, a, in a growing pie, everyone's slice will be bigger. Otherwise, these guys just take their money and go somewhere else. Okay. Well, I want to thank uh, our viewers for joining us and uh, in another episode of The Philosophical Angle. Thank you very much.